Well, if you would, take your Bibles, go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And we're continuing this week talking about the good shepherd that Jesus is. John 10. We'll be reading the first 18 verses. Mm-hmm. And it's also Lord's Supper Sunday as well. John 10, starting verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. The sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that you are the good shepherd, that you love us, that you provide for us, that you care for us, and that ultimately you died for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the big idea this morning is that Jesus, as the good shepherd, guides protects, calls, and dies for his sheep. First thing in this is that the good shepherd guides his sheep. There's a language that's used of the shepherd, of guiding, of calling, of leading them. It's a language of affection and devotion. This is a shepherd who loves the sheep. This is a shepherd who cares for them. It's why when we tell people, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, we can say that confidently because Jesus loves us. Jesus cares for us. Jesus brings the sheep and leads them. The shepherd leaves the 99 for the one that's, mis- the one that's astray, and there's rejoicing when that one lost is found. So many times we would say, 99%, that's an A+, I'd take that. If you had the opportunity to get a 99% on every test you'd ever take in your life, I think every single one of us would sign up for that, but not Christ. Christ says 99 is not good enough. I'm going for 100. 100, because that one sheep that's missing, God cares about, God loves. And that's the good shepherd who guides the sheep But also the response of the sheep is worth noting, that they follow him. They trust the shepherd because they know that the shepherd has their best in mind. He has their good in mind. And as Christians, we believe that Jesus has our best in mind. So we can follow him. We can trust him because we know where he takes us, he goes with us and he doesn't leave us and he doesn't abandon us and he doesn't bail out on us. He loves us and we can follow him. We can trust him because we know he has our best in mind. So that means that for us in the church, those who lead, those who teach, those who serve, we do it because we care 
not because we want to stroke our ego or build our brand or get Twitter followers or anything <laughs> like that. For our marriages, it means that, and our families, it means we put away our selfishness and we serve each other and we have the best in mind. It's one of the things that I remember telling a man one time was he, he was upset that he didn't get me time anymore. And I, I had to tell him, I said, man, you don't get me time as a priority anymore. Your time as a husband is for the selfless, sacrificial service to your wife and to your kids. If you get me time, great, but you don't get to claim it anymore because your calling is to serve and to sacrifice. It also means for our work that if we want anyone to listen to us for what we have to say, we have to show them how much we care. I got to talk to a guy a couple weeks ago who uh, was in upper management, and he told me, you know, do you want to know the difference between a good leader and a bad leader? Yeah, I do. Yeah, what's the difference? He said, a good leader never asks anything of his people that he's not willing to do himself. And if you do that, they'll follow you. See, the shepherd doesn't get the sheep to do what they don't want to do and like it. He's not whacking them with a stick and saying, come on, you're going to enjoy this. It's like taking your kids to the store or to the, to, to the, to the amusement park. We're going to have fun today. That's not what the shepherd does. The shepherd guides and cares and loves. But the, Jesus also guides because he is the gate, the way, the, not a, the. We have our map figured out on how we're going to get back to Kentucky over the next couple days. And if we pull up the maps, we have a few different alternate routes we can take. Like if Atlanta decides to shut down randomly at about 4 o'clock this afternoon, we'll have a way around it. We can go different ways to get to the same destination. But Jesus doesn't work like that. Jesus is the gate, the way, the door. There is no other way in. Which brings us to the second thing, that the good shepherd protects from the wolves. There's a few things that, are, that, that Jesus mentions in here as threats to the sheep. You have thieves and robbers, you have the hired hand, and then you have the thief, which is an allusion to Satan. And I think we can look at these and, and interpret them differently um, as we see what the threats are. So you see this where there's some that break into the sheepfold, there's some that steal, they kill, they destroy. They don't have the sheep's best interest in mind. In fact, they come, like Jesus says, to steal, to kill and destroy, while he comes to bring life and to bring it abundantly. So we have an enemy, Satan that comes to destroy, that comes to destroy churches, comes to destroy Christians. He doesn't play nice, he doesn't play fair, and he doesn't play clean. This is guerrilla warfare, this is chemical warfare, it's ugly, it's nasty. We counter that, that Jesus comes to bring life. We also see that there are those that come into the sheep pen to lead them to death. Instead of safety, they take them to slaughter. These are the wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, these are the false teachers, the false prophets, those that come in and preach a false gospel, that carry a false message, that give a false hope, and they destroy the sheep pen from within. Most cults and dangerous religious groups don't start with some guy knocking on doors and asking, do you want to wear a matching jumpsuit and commit suicide when the comet flies by? No, they start by infiltrating churches. They start by getting into believers' lives and bringing them away from the safety, leading them away from the protection. There's a video that came out several years ago about um, a, a child that was led out of a mall. And the, kids, and the people that did it didn't go up to the kid and say, come with me, we're going to hurt you. They just said, hey, come with me, and guided them away. And the security camera shows the two people holding the little boy's hands as they lead him out to death. That's a picture of what false prophets do. That's a picture of what false teachers do. That's a picture of what cults do. And did you know that the number one group that Mormons and other false heretical groups draw out of isn't people that they meet on the streets. It's people within churches. Actually, Southern Baptists are the number one recruiting pool for most of those groups. Martin Luther once said that you can never be too gentle with the sheep 
nor too fierce with the wolves. And that's why God gives the church leaders. That's why God gives the church teachers to protect the word, to protect the people, to preserve what God has spoken, and to protect people from falling into those traps. If I were to walk out and see Sam face to face with a rattlesnake, my first reaction isn't going to be, hey Sam, the rattlesnake has a right to live. <laughs> the rattlesnake has, has a place. The, you're in the rattlesnake's way. And if it bites you, it's because you were in its way. My love for Sam is much greater than my desire to see a rattlesnake live. There's going to be a ferocity that that thing is going to be attacked with whatever I've got around. <laughs> Baseball bat, shovel, hoe, bare hands, gun. And after it's dead, I'm going to still beat it because I want that thing dead. I want it away from my child because I love him way more than I love that snake. Amen. There is no th nothing that is going to keep me from protecting my son from that snake. And that is why God gives the church teachers. That's why we're so thankful for people that study for Sunday school, that study for Wednesday nights, that lead. I'm so thankful for people that every week get up and teach kids, get up and teach students, get up and teach adults, because what is that is a measure of protection. So that when someone comes up, and I've had this before, where someone comes up and, and wants to either say something, do something, or God gave them a word, which is always where I cringe and go, what did he tell you? Because I've, I've heard this one before. And perhaps the, the best where, where I knew this was my chance to protect our students when I was a youth pastor was I had this guy that said, God's given me a word I want to give to your students. And I was sipping my coffee and went, okay. And he said, well, I was drinking one weekend and God told me this. And I said, well... Okay, let's back back up. How often how often do you do you get hammered on the weekend? <laughs> every, about every weekend. Okay, and you're you're cool with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not a problem. <laughs> All right. Well, what's the message God's given you? And he proceeded to rattle off the most incoherent, jumbled mess that I've ever heard in my life. And my response was, "Man, your life's a mess, and I don't feel comfortable letting you share with our our students." I don't feel comfortable with that because that's not biblical. One, the way you're living. Two, what you're what you're trying to teach. There's a protection from that. God gives the church shepherds to care and to guide and to point us to the word so that when stuff comes out, because it doesn't have to be true to sell a lot of, of books, that's why I'm so thankful for um, people that are willing to do book reviews, people that are willing to do movie reviews. If, you're, if you ever want to know if a, what a movie has, go check out the group Plugged In Online. It's put together by Focus on the Family. And they will review what's out there and help us discern so that we're not catching ourselves trapped, so that we're not falling victim. I'm so thankful for so many of these ministries that are out there because they help us protect the sheep. They help us stay faithful to the Word. The third thing that we see in this is that the good shepherd isn't finished yet. I love verse 16. I love it. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. He's talking present tense, current to when he was talking. So he's surrounded by a group of followers. He's surrounded by a bunch of disciples. And he says, guys, I've got more that aren't here yet, continues, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Jesus has ownership without possession. And Jesus has ownership over people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. He has ownership over people that we live next door to, people that we pass by in the grocery store, people that we run into in an airport, people that are living on the other side of the world. He has called out a people for himself, and he has marked them, he has brought them, and he is sending us out to go find them. Romans 10, 14 and 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How will those who have never heard hear unless someone is sent? How will those who have never believed believe unless they are shared with? That is an explicit call to missions in John 10 because there are people across the world who have not responded yet, who God has set his love on and he is calling to himself and it's our job to go find them. We don't, get, we don't save them. God does. But we go out and we find these sheep. It's, kind of, it's, it's playing hide and seek. We're going to go find the ones that are out there. And we're going to share with them. And we're going to let God bring them home. If you ever watch those old westerns, they find someone that was a cattle rustler. And they know he was a cattle rustler. Because he looked mean in most of them. But they could always tell if he had someone else's cattle. Because of the brand. Because of the mark that had been put. And there wasn't a mark that you could sharpie over if you wanted to take a cow. It was burned into them. It was seared into their flesh. It was cut into their ears. It was an unmistakable mark. Two bits of encouragement for us as Christians to read John 10, 14 through 16. One, that when God sets his mark on us, when God calls us, when God brings us into the fold, we're his and there's no bailing, there's no disowning, there's no kicking out of the family, there's none of that. Once he has marked us, he has marked us as his own and he's claimed us for all of eternity. But the second thing is that there's others out there we need to find the mark and we can be confident that when we go when we share whether it's sharing in a third world country on the other side of the world or whether it's sharing with our kids or our grandkids or whether it's having that conversation with the checkout lady at Publix when we have those conversations God's not finished yet because he is faithful to see his word produce fruit. And the fourth thing, and this is where Jesus, I have to imagine, absolutely blows his followers out of the water because as on a pivot, he takes the narrative from a hypothetical discussion about the good shepherd laying down his life for his sheep to talking about the willingness of the shepherd to die to then what's going to happen during the passion. Verse 17, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. In verse 15, he reminded them that he lays down his life for the sheep. This is a powerful reminder of God's sovereignty. When we read the Gospels and we read the Passion narrative, we can be broken hearted over what happened to Jesus. When we take the supper here in a few minutes, we're going to observe the body and blood of Christ, the body that hung on the cross, that bore the weight of our sin, that was beaten and scourged and pierced. And we're also going to reflect on the blood of Christ that was spilled, that was poured out. Innocent blood, righteous blood, hands that had never committed any sin were pierced and nails were driven through so that blood would pour out so that we would be forgiven. We can be sorry for Jesus on the cross. But we see here that this is exactly what he wanted to happen. Nothing happens during the passion that God is not fully in control over. Who takes Jesus' life? Nobody. Nobody takes it from him. He lays it down. He gives it freely. Nobody has that authority. The Romans don't have the authority. The Jews didn't have that authority. We don't have that ability to take Jesus' life. He gives it freely. 
So that when we read the Passion narrative, Pilate's actually surprised that Jesus died so quickly. There's, a, there's a, an interesting wordplay where Jesus lets out a loud cry and then gives up his spirit. It wasn't taken. He gave it freely. But we also see that even though, though he gives it, he takes it back again. The good shepherd becomes the offering. And on the cross, Jesus takes our sin in our place and then rises again to show that death doesn't get the final say on Jesus and it won't get the final say on us. So as we wrap up, as we apply two things, as we follow our good shepherd, we follow him and we trust him. We follow him. He has our best in mind. And where he goes, we can follow him. Because he goes with us. He goes before us. He goes beside us. He goes behind us. He goes over us. He goes under us. Am I missing any directions? He is with us. We can follow him. Because he is taking us to good pasture. He is taking us to his rest. He is taking us where he wants us to go, and he isn't going to abandon us along the way. And the second thing that we can do is we can trust him because he has our good, because he has our best. It may not be a temporary good or a temporary best, because Christians go through the plight of suffering. But in the midst of all of that, God <laughs> has our best and his glory in mind. Whatever that looks like, we trust him because we know that he is good. It's kind of like kids with their parents. And uh, Gray went through this phase where he didn't want anything to do with the water. We take him to the beach and he'd just play in the sand, didn't want to get near the water, didn't want anything to do with the pool. You just sit there. And we tried working with him. We ended up buying him some floats. We call him his superhero armor because it makes it really cool for him that he gets to wear superhero armor. And we started working with him to get him in the pool. And we finally got him to where I'd say, all right, buddy, you want to jump into daddy? Mm-hmm. <laughs> he'd walk over, and he'd just kind of fall. Ten minutes later, he is back on the ledge of the pool, does a full toddler waddle sprint, and leaps out. Why is he leaping out? Because he knows Daddy's going to catch him. A couple of times by surprise, but he knows that Daddy is going to catch him. <laughs> and in the same way, we have that trust with our Father. A leap of faith is a leap where we know he is going to catch us. Where we say, Lord, you, I know you have my best in mind. Whether it's our finances, our anxieties, our worries, our stress, our jobs, our families, our own lives, whatever is going on around us. When we jump, we leap out knowing that he is going to catch us, knowing that he isn't going to let us fall, knowing that, the, that he's going to be there. So many times I think we get the wrong impression of God. We think of it like Lucy and the football from Charlie Brown, where she holds the football and at the last second picks the football up, and Charlie Brown goes spiraling through the air and falls down. And we go, I can't trust God because I don't know if he's going to move the football. He doesn't. He catches us. He's faithful. We can follow him because we know that he's taking us with him, and we can trust him because we know that he is going to catch us. That's our application. As we follow our shepherd, we trust him. We want to invite us to, to ready ourselves for the supper. As we prepare our hearts to take it, this is an opportunity for us to observe what Jesus left for his church, which is the Lord's Supper. And this is something that is open for those of you who have received Christ as your Savior and have gone through with believers' baptism. And if we ask that if you haven't gone through those, that you observe and ask yourselves two things. Number one, if you've never given your life to Christ, this is the day for it. This is the day that God has given you to say yes to Him, to follow Him, to trust Him, to give yourself to Him. Is it going to make everything better? Is it going to smooth everything out? No, but you know that you're not going to be alone. That's the call of salvation, to trust Him, to say yes to Him, to follow Him. 
And after we get done here this morning, if that's what you want to do, come grab me. Come grab me. We, come grab Ron. Come grab him. Just grab any of us with one of these things on. And if they get mad and say, I've got to go somewhere, just tell them Pastor Scott said to. <laughs> All right? But go and, and don't leave here without making that right. And the second thing on baptism, if you've never gone through with it, would you consider being obedient and going public? My cousin, a, a few years ago, posted on Facebook that he was going public, and I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know if he was coming out with a record label or if he um, had something that he was debuting. And then as I read the thread, he was getting baptized, and that's what their church called it, was going public, telling the world that, that he loved Jesus, telling the world that he was following him. A few weeks ago, churches across Florida did it at the beach, because why not? But also so that it was a public testimony of saying, I love Jesus and I'm following Jesus. And if you've never gone through with that, can I encourage you to do that in the safest place possible to say yes to following Jesus? If you were to stand up in the middle of a shopping mall or the middle of a crowded intersection or on the middle of the beach and get on a platform with a megaphone and say, I love Jesus and I want the whole world to know, you may get mocked, you may get ridiculed, you may even be told to sit down and be quiet. <laughs> but here, if you say, I'm willing to follow him, I'm willing to go public, you'll be surrounded with people that will pray for you, encourage you, and support you. And if you can't do that here, how are you ever going to be able to do it out there? It's a challenge. If you've never gone through with being baptized... Would you consider doing it? It doesn't make you a Christian. We don't believe that. We believe that you're just as much a believer before you get in the water as you do afterwards. But it's a public testimony of what God's done in your life. But for those of you who have gone through with receiving Christ and being baptized as a believer, would you join with us as we take the supper, as we look forward to when Jesus comes back, when the supper won't be piece of bread and a, and a small glass of juice. It'll be a wedding feast with the Lamb. And that's what we're looking forward to. Let's pray and then I'll invite our deacons to come down. Father, we thank you so much for your word that we stand on, that we cling to. And as we see Jesus as the shepherd, we know that he has our best in mind. He has our good. And Jesus, I pray that we would trust you and that we would follow you wherever you take us, wherever we, wherever we find ourselves, that we would cling to you because you have our best. And Lord, I pray that we would trust you just like a child trusts their dad to catch them, that, that we would leap to you knowing that you have us. In Jesus' name, amen.